in a minute, Pastor will come to preach the morning service, but our final song now will be number 22. 22, we'll sing How Great Thou Art. Thank you, Jerry. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 2. Things just seem a little bit different today, and I don't know what it is, but wow. A big group of people, I see that, but and, and we're missing some. That's what is, uh, but I don't think that's what's different. I don't, I just don't know. I'm, I'm excited, but I'm <laughs> just something's different this morning. <laughs> what? I'm missing a fan. Yeah, but I have several out here. All right, Romans chapter two. Romans chapter two. I actually, we're. I'm going to read uh, verses one through five. But that's not where I'm starting. I, I have to go back into Romans chapter 1 in order to continue on. But let's read. This is the main focus uh, today and probably next week. Beginning at verse number 1, verses 1 through 5. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. 
For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation at the righteous judgment of God. We want to look at the righteous judgment of God. Uh, like I said, today, probably next week, but uh, we're going to go back to chapter 1 and read some verses and then to bring us up to date into verse number, or chapter 2. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll continue. Father, we thank you for teaching us. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for explaining things and helping us to understand. Lord, I pray that as we look at this passage that um, you would show us yourself, show us us, and help us to see where we fail. Lord, guide us, give us uh, wisdom as we look at this passage. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to duck down behind the pulpit just for a second just to get rid of a thing that I'm kicking. It's making noise. See? It made noise. Let's go back to chapter 1 and look at verse number 28. Now, verse number 2 of, of uh, I'm sorry, verse number 1 of chapter 2, you see the word therefore, and we always have to talk about that and go back and see what it's there for because he's bringing us, Paul is bringing us into uh, some other uh, thinking in a sense. But verse number 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, many times when we look at chapter 1 here of Romans, we, we know he's talking, he does talk about people from way in the past and how they have, they have messed up their lives and messed up the, their relationship with God, but it applies today too, okay? There's nobody different from today. We didn't evolve from some sort of ape, okay? We came from Adam, and every, every human being is the same. Right? Just human beings, nothing different, not getting better, not getting worse. I mean, you might think we're getting worse in sinfulness, but no, it's the same. There's nothing different about human beings from day one that God created Adam. And so, as, as we look at this, we're keeping in mind, this is the way the natural man is. Okay? And, and, and when we look at verse number 32, he says, he uses the word who, and then he says, knowing the judgment of God. So these people, whoever they are, know the judgment of God. And that word judgment there uh, is not just uh, like you, you picture a judge at the, a bench in a, in a courtroom. And it's not a, not a person who is just uh, deciding the, the guilt or innocence of somebody. The word judgment here has the idea of, of uh, righteousness. The righteous choosing of God. The righteous decision making that God has upon people. When God looks at men he sees and, and women, he sees them all the same. And he judges according to what he has taught in his word. And his judgment is right, absolute, righteous, and, and, and there's nothing wrong in it. Okay, so that's what, he, when he's talking about judgment of God, that's what he's talking about. And so when he says who, who is he talking about when he says who? Well, we go back up to verse number 28, and we see he's talking about they and them. 
okay? Who are they and what, what is it about them uh, that we, we need to know? And so and this is what we want to look at in order to go into, into chapter 2. So right there in verse number, verses um, uh, 28 through 32, we see <coughs> the, the, what God tells us about the sinfulness of mankind. And as, as we look at this, this sinfulness of mankind in right here in chapter 1, and then when he's talking about this righteous judgment of God in chapter 2, verse number 5, we want to compare them. Okay, the righteousness of God compared to the sinfulness of men. Well, I want to look at these. We're going to... I'm going to describe them and, and define these things in verses 29 through 31. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. I hope I don't. I might, though. But as, and, and that's not my focus today. I want us to see these things and, and understand what they mean. And then we're going, to, we're going to go on. So first of all, he says fornication. And fornication, we understand. Well, before we uh, get to fornication, look at what he says. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is, uh, again, it, it, it has to do with this judgment or justice of God. There is no justice in mankind. They're filled with unrighteousness. The Bible says there is none that doeth good. No, not one. And so uh, when we look, out, look at, at these things... We're going to see how righteous God is in comparison to mankind and their sinfulness. And we're going to see that, that these things are the way people live outside of God's approval, outside of God's righteousness. And these things that he mentions he says, are worthy of death. Verse number 32, he says, uh, they, that which, they which commit such things are worthy of death. Okay, so every one of these sin, or these types of sin, is worthy of the punishment of death. So unrighteousness, all unrighteousness is there is no living within God's approval. Mankind without Jesus Christ is outside of God's approval. He goes on, he says, fornication. Fornication, we know, is um, any sinful activity or sexual activity outside of God's uh, marriage. Yeah. And, and so, when we think of that, it's not just in the physical realm. It has also to do with the spiritual reality that anything outside of a proper relationship with God is also considered spiritual adultery or fornication. People who go to, to worship anything, including uh, idolatry, including covetousness, we'll see that word later, that is, is this is what I am, I am focused on. And if I'm not focused on God, then I am living in fornication. Okay? So that's, that, that applies there. Look at the, these other things. He says, it says, uh, uh, fornication, wickedness. Wickedness is, is malice. It's something evil. It is simply badness. Okay? Anything you can name that is bad is included right there in wickedness. And then he goes on. Uh, covetousness. Covetousness is greediness. It's an improper desire. To, to covet means a de to desire. But when, he's con when we, we look at the word and we understand that he's talking about this is something that is bad, this is an improper desire. Okay? If, you, if you're hungry and you, and you desire food, is that a bad thing? As long as you're hungry. <laughs> if you're full and you still desire food, now you've got a problem. Okay? That might not be an improper desire. That's covetousness. Paul says covetousness is idolatry. Why? Because, like I said earlier, this is what I'm focused on. This is what I want. This is, this is what I desire instead of God. Okay, so I'm, 
I'm, it's idolatry to go away from God and worship or want something else. Um, maliciousness. Maliciousness is, again, it, it has to do with this badness. The word malice is right in there in that word, maliciousness. And so it's evil, it's, it's badness. And then he says, full of envy. Envy means evil. Now, now remember, jealousy in its proper place is okay. And you go, what? Jealousy is okay? Yeah, God says he's a jealous God. So if God can be jealous, I can be jealous. Okay? But I have to be jealous in the right way. This is envy, and it is evil jealousy. It is looking at somebody and thinking, I wish I were in their place or they were in my place. It goes both ways. Envy. Then he says murder. Murder is unjustified killing of a human being. Usually it is uh, planned and it's out of anger on purpose. Murder. Debate. How, how many of you have, just a question, how many of you were ever on a debate team in college or high school? <laughs> I don't think I could do that. This does not mean you cannot debate. Okay? The word debate here is talking about the tendency toward strife between people. I must argue with you. That's debate. Okay? It's not a, it's not a matter of a, a proper uh, discussion and showing your point with somebody else's point. It's strife, contention. Uh, deceit. Deceit. We, we, the word guile is, means deceit. And, and so we wouldn't normally say, okay, deceit means guile because it's hard for us to understand what guile is anymore. But guile means deceit or deceitfulness. And it, it means um, to be a selfish, selfish subtlety. Or as, as we might say, crafty. And it's a bad craftiness. How many of you, people do crafts, right? Well, whatever they want to do, some sort of craft. Nothing wrong with that. But crafty is the idea of, of the way Satan was when the serpent uh, deceived Eve. He was crafty. He was subtle, the Bible says. That's what deceit is. Malignity. When we think of something that is malignant, we think of cancer. It is something that is going to spread. And so this malignity is means of bad character. It, it's two words that, that, that means um, the word bad, and it's the Greek word kako, K-A-K-O, and the word uh, ethos, like ethics, bad ethics, bad manners, malignity. And so the, the malignity is, that doesn't mean something that's just some evil thing that's spreading in your body. It means you have bad manners, and you spread those bad manners and bad character on other people. Malignity. Whisperers. <laughs> Have you ever told, told, whispered to somebody in church because you didn't want everybody else around you to hear, just say something because of what the pastor said? That's sin. No, no. <laughs> it's not, a, it, it, to whisper is not, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about quietly speaking evil about somebody else. Okay? That's what the, the words mean. Um, quietly slandering somebody else. Backbiters. If you tell a little kid, a, a two or three year old, don't be a backbiter. I don't bite people's backs. But that's what, what, what it means is you are, you are again, it, it, it even uh, includes this whispers, you are speaking evil of somebody behind their back. You are slandering them. Uh, you're speaking evil uh, against somebody and they're not there to, to defend themselves. You ever bite somebody's back to their face? You can't do that, can you? So you have to do it up behind their back, and that's what that's idea there. Haters of God. That means somebody who hates God. A hater of God. Simple. Nothing, <laughs> nothing different about that. Hater of God. 
despiteful. Despiteful means to treat others shamefully in a way that they should not be treated. Everyone is of value. And to treat somebody shamefully is despiteful. He goes on and he says proud. That's a pretty clear one. But uh, to be proud is to act as if you are better than other people. Boaster. Boasters are braggarts. What's a braggart? To brag about yourself. To say what you, uh, uh, you put yourself above other people. And again, I'm better than you. Inventors of evil things. Simply to plan out evil. To plan to do something evil. And it starts with thinking. Remember, all of these starts with the way we think. Disobedient to parents. The words there mean that you're disobedient to your parents. Without under, not that this is new, without understanding. Disobedient to parents, without understanding. There are people in the world who are without understanding because they were born that way. And they cannot learn. But this is talking about people who have the ability to gain wisdom, but will not. So they are without a proper understanding. They are fools. And they remain fools because they choose to be that way. They won't say they're fools, but they are because they do not learn and they will not learn. It's their choice to be that way. Uh, let me, let me join, to put two of them together real quick here. Uh, covenant breaker and implacable. You see that in verse number 31. A covenant breakers, then you have without natural affection, then implacable. So put, just think of covenant breaker and implacable. They're, they're similar in that they both, a covenant breaker and somebody who is implacable, both of them will break an agreement. And they don't care. The covenant breaker is a person who, any kind of agreement that people make together, that person doesn't really care about the agreement. He's going he's gonna to agree to, to do something. I'll give you $50 if you do this, and da da da. And then he'll just change it and say, no, it doesn't apply. The implacable is, is more of a breaking of a treaty. It's where people are at odds with one another. Then they come to an agreement to be at peace. And the one who is implacable says, oh, okay, I'm breaking this. I'm going to continue to be at war with you. Uh, just, a, just a minor difference between the two, but just breaking off the agreement because they don't care about the other person. Without natural affection, between those two words, without natural affection, I know there are many kinds of, of things we can think about that are without natural affection, but what this, um, what this means is not just what Paul talks about of, of men lusting after men and women after women and things like that. Without natural affection means that you don't have a natural love for your own family. All right? You've heard of, of you remember what, what God said in, in the Old Testament. He says, um, I won't forget you like a mother cannot forget her uh, child that she's nursing. And then he says, they may forget, but I'm not going to forget. A, a, a mother naturally loves her children, her babies, when, they, when they're born and takes care of them. But there are people, and I just saw it on the news just recently. Maybe it didn't happen just recently, but I just saw it. Somebody threw their baby in the garbage. Newborn baby. That is without natural affection. And, and there are people that are like that. There are no love for their uh, relatives. We've just looked uh, in the last few weeks about be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. And we talked about that. This is the, these are the same words. Kindly affectioned and without natural affection. It's the same idea of loving our physical families. Uh, unmerciful. No compassion. Unmerciful. So now, 
I'm going I'm to pick out some of these, some of these that may be, um, just to bring us up to chapter 2. All of these we see in verse number 32. They which commit such things are worthy of what? Death. The wages of sin is death. And so, when you look at all of these things that he just said, all of them are, uh, 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 let's say, one of them. Pick any one is worthy of death. Okay? Let me just, let me just read uh, covetousness. When I covet something like I shouldn't, that's worthy of death because it's against God. Covetousness, envy. How, how many of you, think about it, don't raise your hand. How many of us have ever been envious of somebody else? Uh, how many of us have ever deceived somebody? Deceit. Worthy of death. Whisperer. Again, it's not the <laughs> just being quiet about something. It's talking about somebody, hurting somebody's character. It's 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 the idea of, of blasphemy. When we talk about blasphemy, we normally think of speaking evil about God, but we can blaspheme the character of somebody else. That is a whisperer or a backbiter too. Um, proud, proud, a boaster, and then this one, disobedient to parents. I know most most of us are, are grown. Some of us still live at home, but have we ever, at some time in our life, ever been disobedient to our parent? It's worthy of death. Why? Why is it worthy of death? Because God is absolutely, purely righteous. There is nothing evil in God. Not even close. He is infinitely good in comparison to everything. And so when, when the Bible tells us here that we commit these things, we do these things, we are worthy of death. And look what verse 32 says. Not only, he says, who, those people who know the judgment of God, not only do the same, they fulfill their lusts in these same sinful desires and sinful actions, not only do the same, but even if they're not doing them, they don't care if somebody else does. They take pleasure in those that do it. Therefore, therefore, in, in chapter 2, Paul says, you are inexcusable you are you have no excuse to judge others unrighteously you if you continue if you do these things if you have take pleasure in doing those things you are you're worthy of being punished by death penalty and so he says you are inexcusable Whosoever thou art that judgest. So does that mean we cannot judge? <laughs> no. If we go, go to Romans, I mean, sorry, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is, is teaching about judging. And I know, and we're going to read it a little bit later, but I know that I've said it many times. Jesus said, don't judge by the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So in order to judge righteously, to judge righteous judgment, we must know what God accepts. Not accepts, but accepts. What, God, what is right before God, and we can judge properly. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, look at verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. He says, listen, if you're going to judge this way, if you're going to judge this person in this way, you're going to be judged the same way. So you better be careful how you judge somebody. Okay? Verse 3. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye? That's a little sliver, right? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. You know, if I, if I were to come to you and you, and you had something in your eye or, you know, you get a little speck and you wanted to find, get it out, and I came to you like this, 
You think I can do it? I can't see you from here. So I'm not going to be able to see the speck. Now, I don't, have a I don't have a beam in my eye, but I need the glasses, okay? So God's, Christ says, get, the, get out the, the big thing that's blocking your view. He's not talking about seeing. He's talking about judging. Get the thing out of your life in order to judge righteously. Um, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Once you can see clearly, then you can judge righteously. It is okay to judge when we judge properly. But even in our judgment, now let me, let me, I want this to be clear to us. I want you to go over to um, the book of uh, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Now I want to be clear because When we judge, and when we have the necessity to judge, and Jesus says to judge righteously, it is possible to judge righteously even if there is something wrong in my own life. Now, you know, how can you do that? Because we can judge righteously based on what God says. Okay, look at look at Second Samuel chapter twelve, and we see the account of David being um, David has, has has sinned against God by taking Bathsheba, having her um, husband killed in battle, and so he's guilty of adultery and he's guilty of murder, right? And uh, Nathan comes to. Um, let David know he's, he, he did wrong. David knows he does, did, did wrong. But look at the, this uh, story that um, Nathan told about the man who took the uh, ewe lamb from the poor man. Look at the start of verse 3. But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought up and, and brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom. It was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But took, he didn't, he didn't get his own things. He went over next door and took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Now, look what, look what David says, okay? Now, and, and, and you can see that David is judging. And David is judging righteously. And I'll, I'll point that out to you. Look at verse 5. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. Not the man who's telling the story, but to the rich man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. He'll restore fourfold. Go over to Exodus chapter 22. Now David, keep in mind, David has sinned against God. He's already done those evil things. And there's no, no evidence in the scripture around the, the, the accounts here that David has repented. Okay? He's sinned against God. And now he's told this story. But look at, look at chapter 22. God's word, God's law, tells the punishment of a person who steals somebody else's property. Look at verse, 22, uh, verse 1. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, so in this case the man says he was killed, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. See, David knew that. That's why David said he will restore fourfold. So as long as David knew God's word and what God expected, he could judge righteously, even though there was still sin in his own heart. That doesn't mean he's supposed to stay that way. 
we, as we judge, we must look to God's Word. We must know God's Word if we're going to judge anybody. Because God's Word is God's righteousness. And it's God's righteous judgment. We cannot judge based on what we think. We've got to be careful even when we think. And I remember growing up and somebody would say, you know, the Bible says for men to be clean shaven. It's nowhere there. Okay. And, and people can tell you what the Bible says, but if it doesn't say it, don't believe them. Get to know the Word of God for yourself because that is going to be the righteous judgment. That is going to be the way you can decide who is right and who is wrong and what is right and what is wrong. Because it's always going to be right. And David, even in his sinful condition, judged rightly, judged righteously. So it is possible for people to judge righteously even if they are not living right. As long as they use God's Word. Because God is the one who is doing the judging. I think I told you about the guy I told, I was witnessing to one time. He was an ex-convict. He was working with me in a, in a forestry station. I was talking to him about the Lord and what uh, uh, mankind. Uh, he didn't like me telling him that he was sinful. He spent time in prison, but he wasn't sinful. <laughs> but he's ready to beat, beat me up. I mean, he, wasn't, he wasn't going to. I, I was just kind of afraid because the way he looked at me, and he had an axe in his hand. But... Uh, <laughs> but uh, even if I had sin in my heart, I was right in what I told him. Because that's what the Bible says. And so we need to know that what God says is righteous. Now Paul says here in, in uh, Romans chapter 2, look at verse number 3. Is the, These people who are judging, he's saying, you're judging, and he says, you, uh, you're condemning yourself. And that's what happened to David, remember? Nathan said to David, right after David said, the man, he'll, he'll die and he'll restore fourfold. And what did David say, uh, Nathan say? Thou art the man. Thou art the man. You just judged yourself, David. Number one, you're supposed to die. How are you going to restore fourfold the wife to the man you killed? Can't do it. You know, God is merciful. God was merciful to David and says, you're not going to die. Wow. We know that he was worthy. It was worthy of death. But we need to judge, he says, righteous judgment. Look at verse number 3 here. Paul says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such thing, and doest the same? You're judging, and you're doing the same thing that you're judging. Okay? Do you think or that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Do you think God's not going to judge you? Yes, He's going to judge you. So we need to judge righteous judgment, but we also need to judge ourselves. And that's what Jesus said in Matthew. Judge, uh, judge not that ye be not judged. He doesn't say don't judge, period. He says if you're going to judge, judge righteously. Because the way you look at other people is the way they're going to look at you or the way God is going to judge you. Judge according to what God says. God is just. God is righteous. God judges righteously. And when, if you consider ourselves and consider those things in chapter 1 that Paul mentions all these evil things and every one of them is worthy of death you look at yourself and I look at myself and yes without Christ I am worthy of death the wages of sin is death but God is merciful and we saw David did not get killed God said, I'm not going to punish you in that way. God is a God of compassion. God is merciful. Remember what Jeremiah said in Lamentation. He said, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. 
So as we judge righteous judgment, using God's word, knowing what God says, then we lost my train of thought there. We need to have the compassion that God has toward us. We need to have the compassion on others. Tonight we're going to look at John chapter 8 and see where the Pharisees brought somebody to Jesus that we found this person in this way and that's a sin. They are worthy of death. See, the people did not have compassion. They didn't care about the law. They didn't care about God at the time. They cared about fighting Jesus. So many people today are more interested in fighting God than they are of making peace with God. We are God's people and we should have compassion number one on one another. We should have compassion on the lost, the whole world, because God did that to, for us. You know, Jesus died for us while we were still God's enemies. In the real, in the world we live in, that doesn't make any sense. But in God's compassion and God's mercy, it makes a whole lot of sense when we know who God is and God being righteous. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for you. We thank you that we can recognize that even as you judge, it is righteous. It is proper. You never go overboard. You never give anybody punishment that is more than they deserve. So, Lord, even as we look at these things, look at the sinfulness of mankind, the punishment is death, which is not going overboard because of your goodness, your rightness. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to recognize your goodness, your righteousness, your proper judgment, that you'll never make a mistake when you judge people. Help us to learn to judge as you judge. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.